Welcome to the first episode of the Open Source Yoga Interview Series. My name is Lizzie Lassiter, speaking from Munich, Germany, and today I'm interviewing Judith Hansen Lassiter, who joins us from San Francisco, California. I'd like to introduce Judith Hansen Lassiter, who's been teaching yoga since 1971. She holds a PhD in East-West Psychology. She's a physical therapist. She's been teaching all over the world and in most states in the United States. She's a co-founder of Yoga Journal Magazine. And for a long time, she was a board member of the California Yoga Teachers Association and a co-founder that was one of the first professional yoga teachers associations in the United States. Hi, Mom. Hi, Lizzie. (laughs) Thanks for joining me for this interview. So as you know, the topic of today's conversation is your home practice. And it's called Open Source Yoga, which is correlated with a series I'm doing to help people design their own home practice. And the idea is a little bit behind the curtain, backstage look at home practice, taking from the tech world the idea of open source, really sharing with people the secrets so they can have success on their own. So my first question is, when and where did you take your first yoga class? I took my first yoga class in Austin, Texas. I had just become a part-time employee of the YMYWCA, which supported the university and students there. I was working part-time. And one of the perks was uh, to take a yoga class. Well, I wasn't at all interested in yoga really at first because I thought it was sitting on nails, but I decided to take the class because I wanted to start dancing again. And I thought it would help me get ready to do that. So that's where I took my first class. What year was it and how old were you? It was 1970 and I was 23 years old. And I took this class um, and it was as if someone had opened a door. It was black or white. It was a demarcation in my life, an extreme demarcation because something awoke in me in that first class. It was as if it was a sudden remembering. And I got up the next day and did whatever I remembered. It was on one day I was not doing yoga and the next day I was doing it. And soon I began to read everything I could get my hands on. And I just fell in love with everything, the Sanskrit names, the poses, the meditation, the philosophy. It was quite a a transformation for me. So can you describe a little bit about what the yoga class looked like back then? What what did you wear? Was there music? What were the yoga mats? Kind of a little bit of the aesthetics of the what yoga was like back then? Well, it was a practice that I think is very appropriate for our very busy and push-push lives. We wore loose cotton white yoga pants, um, I guess a t-shirt or an Indian kurta, long shirt. And uh, it was a quiet room, a darkened room, we would do a pose and then lie down, do another pose and lie down. It was very much about being soft and slow and introspective. And there were no yoga mats back in the old days. (laughs) I had a inexpensive oriental looking small rug that could roll up and you would unroll your little rug and you would lie on that. Mm -hmm. And I still have that rug, by the way. Hmm. So you got up the next morning after your first class and you practiced what you remembered. What were the first, let's say the first year of your home practice? How regular was it? Also, how did that look like? Was it in the living room, more public with roommates or was it by yourself? 
how did you start exploring practicing at home? Well, I had one of the reasons was that I took up the practice that I was willing to do it was I, as I said, I wanted to start dancing again. But another very important reason was I had insomnia. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had very hard time going to sleep. I was keyed up. And one of the things that I learned immediately was that you could actually choose to relax you could lie down on the floor and breathe and consciously let go. I thought relaxation was something that just happened to you. So when I got up in the morning, the next day, I felt so good. I felt so integrated in myself. There was a, I had gone to sleep after, you know, after the class and I had slept, I'd gone right to sleep and I'd slept so well. So I got up and I just did in the living room, I had a little apartment by myself and I just did whatever I remembered. I cannot remember what that was, but we did. I know that our practice was probably sun salutations, some back bends, some forward bends, some twists, maybe an inversion in there somewhere. I don't think I did a headstand my first class, but I, we started just learning a very traditional a traditional sequence so very soon and I was doing headstand shoulder stand plow and uh, always shavasana always shavasana and there were no props just <laughs> you and your mat and the floor so how long would you say you were practicing for 30 minutes in the morning or what was the time like I would say no more than 45 minutes and were you practicing every day, right away? I was practicing every day, right away. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that is typical. <laughs> no. I, <laughs> <laughs> so how long before you went to India for the first time? All right. That was in 1970 when I started practicing. And in 1971, I was already teaching. In 10 months, I, I, already, I took over a yoga teacher training program, a yoga teacher program, not a training program, um, of 20 classes a week. And some people would come every day. And I, so I had a population of 200 students, <laughs> which was fine because I had no training, but I had a lot of love. I had love. I totally loved it. I loved everything about it. So I was that, that next year, sometime in that next year, probably in the fall of 1971, one of my students brought me a book called light on yoga. Mm. And like every good greedy yoga student, I didn't read it. I turned it immediately to the back and looked at all the poses. <laughs> and, I, and my initial response was nobody can do those poses. So then a few months later, I married, as you know, and we moved to a ranch, an isolated ranch in South Texas. And it was very quiet in the country. So I remember thinking, oh, yes, that book. So I took out that book and I started trying to do the poses from the very beginning. And I began to get some understanding a little bit of them. Um, and so that's how I knew about him. And then we moved to California and I immediately had the good fortune. It's another long story of meeting up with some, the few yoga teachers that were in the San Francisco Bay area. And two years later, we brought through a whole series of coincidences, BKS Iyengar to the Bay Area. So in 1974, I studied with him in the Bay Area. He came back in 1976, and that's when I decided to go to India. So I went in the over the in late late in the year over the Christmas time for five weeks in '76. A few weeks in 76 and a couple weeks uh, for the whole five weeks into 1977. And 
I have I have since I be, I had been studying with him for many years. Uh, I I came back to my original belief when I first got the book. I thought no one can do these poses. Then I decided, oh, they were doable. But after I studied with him and studied the method and practiced more, I realized once again, no one can do these poses. <laughs> it's, it's it's a continual unfolding of not being able to be some ideal. It's a con- practice is a continual peeling of the onion of our attachments to what we think we should do. And this is a point I'd like to make here now, although you didn't ask me this question is that practice evolves. When I started in my twenties, I was 23 I could pretty much try anything. Uh, but as you know, as I as I age, as I grow, and I think this is true for everyone, and through my 30s and through pregnancies and through my 40s and all the hormonal changes that women go through and the life changes that, and everything that happens, uh, what we need to get from our practice can change. And it was a lesson for me to learn to let, not only let, but encourage the freedom of my practice evolving. That was exactly, yeah, that was exactly my next question. What does your practice look like today and how has it evolved since 1970? Well, apparently I'm quite psychic. That's one thing. (laughs) But it's a dance to me between my life and my practice. Mm-hmm. And one thing that's happened is my idea of what practice is has gotten huge. It's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I would say now is my yoga practice, not just my asana practice, but my yoga practice is what's in front of me right now. Mm-hmm. Whatever that is, am I chopping carrots? Am I standing on my head? Am I talking to you? Am I writing on a chapter for a book? Am I giving it my attention? Am I present with it? Am I learning from it? Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then on a slightly more practical view, when I wake up, instead of having a set practice, I think, what does my body need right now? What does my nervous system need right now? Do I need a little energy or do I need a little rest or do I need to build some strength? Do I have something difficult to do today? I want to build confidence and strength through my practice. Do I need to let go? Do I need solace? So I try to think about how I can use this amazing gift that's been handed down person to person for centuries. How can I use it to bring me into the radical present so I can live with an open heart? Mm -hmm. So it's become much less about the physical asanas and the form and much more about the quality of attention for you. Yes and no. It's definitely about the physical form because I don't know if meditation arises so our body assumes a meditative position or we assume a meditation meditation meditative position and we attract that state of being like we we become the flower we attract the bee mm-hmm. do we do we by assuming the position with clear intention attract consciousness or does our consciousness shift over time that we long for that position and i actually think the answer is yes to both Mm -hmm. so if i may Mm -hmm. practice for me now in a practical way is a probably about half supported poses long supported shoulder stands supported back bends uh as a general rule i I do that about half my practice. And then the other practice, I just choose whatever I'm in the mood for. Arm balances, standing poses, forward bends. Today's Tuesday. So Tuesdays, I tend to do forward bends. Uh, 
but it's more play in a way. It's a little free. I always do a long supported shoulder stand and halasana because I think generally for me and in the world the way it is, I need to be upside down, which is poses it, put you upside down, give you perspective. And I need to be introspective as well. So that is what I do. And then I usually separate my resting, my Shavasana from that practice. Cause when I do that more active practice, I'm, I'm ready to get up and move and go do my day. So I try to p- put Shavasana in, in the afternoon when I sort of th- feel three o'clock ish kind of have a sinker instead of thinking of a sweet or, you know, a frappuccino, which would be not pretty if I drank, but instead of having something like that to pick me up, I go do my, I lie down for 20 to 30 minutes and do Shavasana. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So in terms of kind of practical rules or recipe that you have for your practice, your morning practice, do you have any kind of guidelines for yourself? Like it has to be 30, I get on my mat for 30 minutes or I practice before breakfast or what are some of your practical tips? Well, okay, practical trips, tips for me, and then I'd like to give some suggestions for our listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, I have found that my day is always better if I do the most important things first. Because when we do wake up and hopefully from restful sleep, the mind is a little less agitated. And it's super hard now because we have the thought, oh, just let me check my email. Mm -hmm. Two hours later, you're still just quote unquote checking your email or your messages. So I find it extremely important. It's always been important and my choice, but it's extremely important now when I get up I go sit on my meditation cushion or sometimes if I think I'm going to be tempted to go do something, I'll just sit up in bed and do a short sitting. And then I, I really put the priority of doing my practice because as I did this morning before this call, because it, once I've done my practice, the rest of the day feels like it's possible. So I do it first thing. Um, I have a place where I can do it. I'm lucky enough, fortunate enough to have a, a room where I have my props, I have it set up, there's nothing else going on in there. But one doesn't need that. One just needs a space in the corner of a room or a dedicated space. Um, I don't take electronics into that room, which is sometimes harder than other times. Sometimes I listen to music, uh, Indian ragas or whatever, that puts me in the mood. Sometimes I'm just silent. But... I find that there's something that can be so beneficially compelling about a routine, especially because I work for myself and I I have different routines every day or I'm traveling or I'm at home, but I have a point. And so I always just block off that morning time and won't take phone calls or interviews or or any other activities before that as much as I can. So as far as everyone uh, practice, as, as, well, let me back up. As far as timing, I try to set a time frame, whether I need it or not. Like if I'm getting up early to go to the airport, I have 20 minutes, I I I give myself to that 20 minutes. Other days I want more time, you know, 45 minutes or even an hour. And I, I set the limit, even if there is no limit, because that helps me focus. Uh, I don't set a timer, although I recommend that for some people. I say, all right, I'm just going to stay on my mat for 45 minutes today and see what happens. I commit to that boundary Instead of having the voice in my head that says, oh, you really should go do a bunch of yoga. I say, okay, I'm going to do third. Maybe there's resistance or I'm thinking about something or I'll just say 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Do you still experience resistance to practice? Sometimes. Wow. How human of me. No, that's very encouraging. Yeah. Because my mind, my mind is just as... It's not that my mind 
is calmer. My mind is still generating 60,000 thoughts a day, like everyone's. But I, what the practice has done for me is it has allowed me to see that and to know what's going on. Oh, there's my mind resisting again. And, you know, and then I just say, okay, mind, you go in that corner over there and you just resist. I'm going to go do my practice. Hmm. So it's, that's the gift of yoga. It's not, the gift of the practice is not overcoming ourselves. It's knowing ourselves and knowing we've been down this path. The mind says, oh, just go eat something. Oh, just check your email. And I'm like, once in a while, I just do that and I get caught. But most of the time, I just say, oh, there's that thought of doing something else again. Let me just go be, and lie on my mat and, and let the practice arise. Because the victory is not that you do it an hour or two hours or 30 minutes. The victory is that we actually just get on the mat and the yoga will arise. It's sort of like when I used to go jogging. The hardest part was getting to the track. Once I got there, I just went, okay, and I started. Once I did one lap, I had forgotten the resistance. Once I've done one pose, two poses, I've forgotten the resistance. And even if the resistance is really strong at that moment, and I decide to quit, great, I've done five poses, I've done two poses, I've done 15 minutes, I've done 10 minutes. It, so what I suggest that uh, our listeners remember that the most important thing, if you want to take up a home practice, buy a sticky mat. <laughs> <laughs> because if you have a mat, you're more likely to get on it mm -hmm. and find a place to put it. So you'll see it when you get up, like at the other end of your bedroom or out in the hallway or in the living room. So someplace you're going to stumble on it. And you go, oh, yes, let me just at least do dog pose. Uh, you know, it's nice if you have a couple props that will help you. When I travel, I take a traveling sticky mat and I put it so that when I open my suitcase, it's the first thing on top. So that I think immediately when I arrive at the hotel room or wherever I am staying for my workshop I'm teaching, I have a place I think of a, I, I see it on top of my clothes and everything. And I look around, where am I going to practice? Do I need to order up a couple of more blankets? Do I, can I do a backbend off of that couch over there? Can I use this wall to do elbow stand as, you know, or headstand? Can I, or handstand? Where am I going to actually do my practice? Another hint that you can do is have a practice buddy. Maybe over Skype, or maybe you meet, you go to someone's house once a week to practice with them, or they come to your house, or when you know someone else is, you know, if you know someone else is waiting for you or looking forward to practicing with you, that often helps. Yeah, I think that's why so many people have consistent success practicing yoga in a class environment because it's an appointment that they put on their calendar. But when it's about, when it's home alone without any sense of accountability, people struggle with consistency. Yes. Uh, but I have some thoughts about that. Please. I have an opinion. Are you shocked? <laughs> no. um, I believe that a person is very tempting now. Well, may, let me back up. In the old days, there weren't cla that many classes. There you didn't have that chance. And so people, it was better in some ways because you, you had to do it on your own. It was harder to find. Now there's classes, you know, every minute of the day online, down the street, roll out of bed. There's probably a class in your living room and you don't even know about <laughs> there's classes everywhere. So that's has an upside and a downside. The, the lovely side of it is the hardest part is getting yourself in the door. Once you've walked in the door, you're committed. And that's where the battle is. So for some people, so, but the problem is when you do a class, you are actually doing someone else's practice. Mm. That's what you're doing. And you're not doing your practice. And so 
I encourage people to make a commitment. It can be five minutes a day, three poses a day. Mr. Eingar used to say, do three poses. And generally what happens is by the time you're into the second pose, you've forgotten that and you're over the hump. So he knew about that. But you, I believe that the mark of a mature student is they have their own practice, that, that the practice of sitting and breathing and stretching and being introspective is something they do for themselves. And they listen to the inner voice and they, and it, it, it begins to become part of who we are. And I make a joke about it. What if we had the same thoughts about practicing yoga every day that we had about brushing our teeth? Mm -hmm. So it would sound some, which we do every day without thinking twice a day, at least. We don't struggle with that. So we get up in the morning and we think, oh gosh, I'm, I, I, I wanted to get up early and brush my teeth, but I'm running a little late. Uh, for work. I, you know, I'm going to take that noontime group toothbrushing class at work today before I go to lunch, but then it gets to be lunchtime and you're hungry. You think, you know, really hungry. I want to eat something. So I'm going to stop by that center that has the great teacher about toothbrushing and I'm just going to brush my teeth there. That's, that'll work great. And then you, you're, you're tired and it's cold and you want to go home. And so you're, you're on your traveling home and you think, you know, I'm just going to practice when I get in. The, I'm just going to walk in the door and I'm going to practice. Of course, you walk in the door and you're hungry or the phone rings or something happens. And then you think, well, you know what? I'm just going to go to bed early and get up tomorrow morning and brush my teeth. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, people ask my students, beginning students have asked me many times, well, is this something I should practice every day? Mm. And I say, no, 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 no just on the days you want to feel better. So it's akin to the piano. I can take a weekly lesson with my teacher and I will make very slow progress, but it was nothing like if I practice every day. A piano teacher expects you to practice a little bit. And, and I think we need to be more clear and lovingly support our students to choose a way to, to integrate this. Into, onto their own mat in their own space. Not about time. It's about consistency. Discipline is not about force. It's about consistency. I'd rather the student practice 10 minutes a day than an hour once a week. Yeah, I, I completely agree because in my, my own experience, my practice at home is a gateway towards intuition and creativity that feeds my other work in a different way than taking a class is. Taking a class is so much more physical for me. It's much more about the body. And I would say that practice at home for me is so much more about my spirit. I agree with that. Practicing at home is to practice at home is to cultivate, cultivate a form of deep listening mm -hmm. that is has the mysterious and wondrous ability to connect us not only with ourselves, but with our practice in a profound way that is so satisfying. And I wanted, I wanted to tell you now, if I could, about the first class I ever taught. Yes. So I want to hear that. This has been so wonderful, Mom. I just, I want to hear that. And then I, I just have one last piece, which is I want to do a quick lightning round where I have five quick questions I'm going to ask all of my interview subjects. Let's do that first, and then I'll tell the story. Okay, so just sort of one word, cheeky, one sentence answers. Me? Cheeky? Yeah. <laughs> so, this morning in my practice, I struggled with... Going up an elbow stand on the harder leg. I feel victorious in my practice when... I feel my heart open and I feel buoyant. When I'm 80 years old, I imagine my practice as? Still happening. <laughs> 
What beginners don't know about home practice is? Everyone struggles. They think it's only them. And the secret to consistent practice is? Not to practice for three weeks and find out in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, what the benefits really are because they're no longer there. Great. So, so I was practicing yoga every day. I was walking around foot off the ground, just feeling so remarkably different in my body. And I was asked by my teachers who were moving away if I would take over this yoga program. And I had no formal training other than my own practice and everything I had read. And I knew I wanted to do that. It was an instant yes. So then it actually happened. And I'm sitting on this little rug that we sat on. And all the students are there in front of me, 25 students or whatever it was. And they were lying down because that's what we did. We came into yoga class and we lay down first. And I looked at them and I went into a panic. Oh my God, what am I doing? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? I don't, maybe if I sneak out, they won't notice. They'll just go to sleep. <laughs> and so I thought, all right, what have I learned to do when I feel anxious, when I feel discombobulated? Breathe. So I close my eyes and I begin to take some slow, long breaths and instantly, I felt the presence. It was visceral. It's still when I say this story from so many years ago, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up and gives me chills up over my head. Right now that's happening and out my arms. I rec I've recognized or sensed my two teachers standing behind me and very quickly their teacher behind them and back into a line of infinity were teachers standing. And I had the very cellular experience and awareness that I was not doing anything. It wasn't about me. I was merely a link in the chain. I was merely a water barrier. I was taking carrier. I was taking the bucket of water from the person behind me and handing it to the person in front of me. And I realized I was part of a phenomenal and virtually infinite tradition. And I completely relaxed and I opened my eyes and I started to teach. And I have never felt the slightest bit nervous about teaching now. And I think that this can help all levels of practitioners if we remember that we are part of a sangha, we are part of a community, a tradition. We are never alone on our yoga mat. And I believe for me, when I get on my yoga mat, I say first a namaste to my teacher and my teacher's teacher back into the mists of time. I give a quiet, silent namaste to all the great teachers who have lifted me to the mat and that I have practiced now and have friends all over the world and students who have practiced. And I know unequivocally when I get on the mat every morning that someone I know and probably someone I love is on their mat too. And I am not alone. And I am in some strange way in a class. I am practicing with the Sangha, the community of practitioners in my in my empty yoga room. And that really helps me. Hmm. That's so beautiful, Mom. Thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview. I really enjoyed it. And I think you shared a lot for people to take a hold of. Thank you so much for having me in this series for asking questions that I enjoyed answering. Namaste. Namaste, Mama. You can find more about my mom, Judith Hansen Lassiter, 
at judithhansenlassiter.com and find out more about my open source yoga audio course at my website, lizzielassiter.com. Thank you so much for joining us.